femoral neck fractures in patients younger than 50 years. This is from the OTA core curriculum lecture series version 5, slides by Dr. Greg Gasky. I'm Saqib Rahman and I'm narrating these slides. So the objectives or questions we want to try to answer uh, in this uh, lecture are, number one, how urgent are femoral neck fractures in young patients? Uh, is there a difference in outcomes uh, between opened and closed reduction? Uh, I want to be able to describe the pros and cons of different surgical approaches. Uh, what's the best implant for femoral neck fixation? Uh, and are complications common after these injuries? Um, so a lot of great questions, uh, some of them probably on your mind. This is the outline for this uh, slide deck. Um, go through the history and physical assessment, talk about anatomy, imaging, classification, uh, initial management. Uh, in the next video, we'll uh, then take on definitive management, uh, and then we will uh, wrap up in the uh, last video with complications, rehab outcomes. So in, in younger patients, these are more frequently high-energy injuries. Um, if they have normal bone physiology, I mean, if it's a young patient who's on dialysis and maybe has abnormal bone to begin with, it could be a low-energy fall, just like in a geriatric patient. But if it's a, if it's a patient with normal bone physiology, usually a simple fall uh, is not causing a femoral neck fracture, uh, but uh, it's more often high-energy injury. So on exam, you certainly may see some shortening external rotation when it's displaced. Um, there will be pain with range of motion. Um, and what we're not talking about as much, but a lot of the principles are, are similar, are um, for uh, elderly patients. So these are more uh, often low energy falls. Of course, a high energy injury can happen in an elderly patient as well. Um, but as I mentioned, it, you can get a low energy fall causing a femoral neck fracture uh, in a patient with abnormal bone and multiple uh, uh, disease states are listed here um, as examples and pathological fractures and then stress fractures. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. So uh, it's important to study the bony anatomy, uh, understand the neck shaft angle, understand the concept of antiversion, which is a little difficult to show in this simple sort of frontal projection, um, understand the sort of thickening or the dense bone uh, that forms the calcar, um, the uh, capsule and uh, labrum also um, are important to understand. The vascular anatomy is important um, because uh, we worry about osteonecrosis with displaced femoral neck fracture. So, the medial femoral circumflex gives rise to the lateral epiphyseal artery, which is the predominant blood supply to the femoral head. Uh, so when you have a fracture with significant displacement, there's a greater risk of vascular disruption. And then osteonecrosis. So basic imaging include an AP and lateral of the hip to evaluate fracture morphology and displacement. Here on the left, you can see there's a displaced femoral neck fracture. Um, and it's important to get that AP pelvis, and you can see this is, you know, nicely done. You can see the spinous processes line up pretty much with the symphysis. You can see perhaps there's an attempt to get 15 degrees internal rotation on that normal side. Uh, you can clearly, clearly see there's some asymmetry here. Sometimes you have to get a traction AP hip x-ray uh, if you have a confusing fracture pattern. Um, let's say you're severely externally rotated and let's say this is the this is the x-ray you get here um, and uh, seems like femoral neck maybe it's basis cervical femoral neck hard to tell where the fracture line is um, so rather than guess um, you know CT scans can be helpful but attraction AP hip if the patient can tolerate uh, can really show it what it's going to look like uh, when you pull traction for instance in the operating room so CT scans can also be helpful as they can help demonstrate uh, the fracture pattern in confusing circumstances. Uh, it can help to identify a non-displaced fracture when you may not otherwise see a fracture. Uh, and of course, it can help identify the trajectory of the fracture line and help you intraoperatively. Um, so if 
do you suspect a femoral neck fracture based on clinical examination and history, but you don't see anything? Um, an MRI is higher, has a higher sensitivity to detect an occult fracture um, and can be helpful. So oftentimes we'll get an MRI uh, if we're really, really looking for a fracture that we can't see. But frequently, um, CT scan will pick up on most non-displaced femoral neck fractures um, that come into the emergency department. So um, anatomically, you can describe, so if you're asked what kind of femoral neck fracture you have, it, it, most, most people will understand if you tell them where it is anatomically. So is it subcapital? Is it transcervical? Is it basis cervical as shown in this image here? And that's important to help guide uh, treatment. And so, certainly if you want to distinguish something that's basis cervical, versus anything proximal to that. And, and, and basis cervical fractures frequently can be treated, and we'll talk about this later, with uh, internal fixation, uh, even in elderly patients. Um, and it's uh, the subcapital fractures and the transcervical ones that we were a little bit more um, about when it comes to uh, osteonecrosis, for example. So garden classification is also fairly universally utilized. So you should also understand this. The type one is the valgus impacted incomplete fracture. The type two is the sort of non-displaced fracture. And these are the ones that are perhaps a little bit more stable, certainly the type one. And then the types three and four really mean you're, you're displaced. Uh, type three is a little bit hard to diagnose you know, where you're complete but only partially displaced versus fully displaced. I think we usually just say, is it a three slash four? Is it displaced? Uh, that's really what drives decision making. Now, it is also important to understand Powell's classification, and this is not a really a niche thing. This is used pretty commonly um, when, when talking with surgeons about uh, these injuries, especially in these patients with the higher energy trauma because uh, we will frequently uh, see some of these uh, Powell's type 3. So this is based on the fracture inclination with reference to the horizontal. So as you can see, the type 3 have somewhat of a steep angle, and the type 1s have more of a shallow angle. So as you can imagine, a more vertical fracture like the type 3s are associated with increased instability because of shear forces. So just imagine when you weight bear on this... That fracture is a little bit more likely to be compressed, right? Whereas you weight bear on this, and this fracture is more likely to shear, right? Hopefully you can you can see that and, and understand why the high Powell's angles or the you know, type threes are a little bit more prone to um, shearing, and uh, we worry more about um, our fixation. So initial management. So we usually don't put these in traction. Um, there's some concern perhaps that this can lead to increased intraarticular pressure and possibly tamponade. And you know that may be a concern for uh, vascular supply to your femoral head. Um, we typically have gotten to the point now where most um, centers consider these to be surgical urgencies, but not emergencies, meaning doesn't have to go to the OR in like one to two hours necessarily or four hours, uh, but the earlier the better, typically within you know, 12 to 24 hours. So this is not a case necessarily that you just sort of admit and you know get done when you can uh, in the next couple of days. I mean, you try to get done by the next day. Um, and the accuracy of reduction is probably more important than time to surgery, I think is what we found. So um, is this becoming less controversial? So here you can see there's some uh, studies showing there is a difference. So 2002 study, younger patients, if fixed within under 12 hours, no osteonecrosis. And if fixed over 12 hours, 16% rate of osteonecrosis. Another paper, uh, British JBS 2011, again, younger patients showing that um, greater 24 hours time to surgery led to an increased failure rate. And there's been other papers showing maybe there's no difference. 
um, retrospective study, younger patients, no difference in timing. Um, JBJS 1984, again, these are small studies. 20% osteonecrosis when fixed early uh, and greater than 36-hour groups, no significant difference. And then JBJS American 2004, again, smaller series, 73 patients, younger patients, 24-hour cutoff, 20% osteonecrosis in both groups. What really was important was the initial displacement and reduction. Um, so what you have under your control is the reduction. So accuracy and reduction really does matter. And one of the reasons for that, and we'll perhaps touch on this again later, is that you have a cortical fracture that's intraarticular. So the problem is cortical fractures, like a, a, for instance, in the diaphyseal shaft of the femur, right? You can set up fracture hematoma. Uh, it's not being bathed in synovial fluid. You can set up a typical cascade of fracture healing, um, which isn't as easy inside a joint. So inside the joint, you can't really set up a fracture hematoma that's stable and then goes on to form uh, bone through the stages of bone healing. If you don't have uh, the cortex opposed to each other, um, then healing is much more difficult. You generally don't heal with abundant callus formation, right? So it's a it's a somewhat unique situation because most you know uh, other bones, the intraarticular component tends to be you know um, you know you have mostly cancellous surfaces. Here you have not a lot of cancellous bone uh, through the cross section in the femoral neck, but you have this cortical bone, but it's being bathed in joint fluid. So I think this is one reason why, you know, you really have to get, you know, an accurate reduction, get those bone ends opposed and compressed. All right, so we'll pause here. We'll pick up with definitive management in the next video. Thanks.